here. Um, we're going to continue going through to some of our lectures and try and get to some of the primary sources and talk about some of that stuff. Don't forget, today is Wednesday, correct? Yes, yeah, which is crazy. It's Wednesday. Tomorrow, 11 o'clock p.m., reflection discussion due. Okay. Everybody good? Um, I believe this is where we kind of left off this general area here, right? Do y'all remember what was the last thing we talked about yesterday? Anybody having? Huh? The tokens. We started talking about the tokens. Okay. Huh? Okay. Um, so, essentially, we started talking about, you know, we had tax records, stuff like that. We have these tokens here. And you have the... the um, <clears throat> I'm going blank right now. Who? The boule, and you had the boule. It was like a wallet, right? Um, and you kind of kept your tax record. You could trade the tokens, maybe. You could keep track of them. That kind of progresses. You had all these different tokens. We know what some of them mean because we have transcriptions that kind of say what they mean and all this. Um, you kind of just need to have a basic understanding of how this worked out. You had sheep with the X and pottery. And this has all kind of gone through. This is an example of, a, of one that they found that was whole with tokens inside. It showed like three sacks of barley, three or four sacks of wheat, four bundles of sheep wool. Okay. You had all these different ones. Once they kind of progress, they realize, hey, it's not a great system here. It's not a great system to uh, just have this fall because you could break or lose it. So, and also to get anything out of it, you had to break it to get it out. We kind of need to figure out a better way to go about um, doing this. So then they, you see, you start seeing the development of these where they took a piece of clay and then they would take your tokens and then just kind of press them into the clay, right? And you would have these indentions, and that would be the tax record. Then you could remove those tokens and use them as you wanted to, but this would be what they kind of said, hey, this is what you had at the beginning, okay? All of this was really just a way of keeping track of mundane details, okay? Like I said, one day... Um, you might look at it and you say, well, this is very rudimentary, right? Like, this is just kind of a weird way to do things. But I want you to think about it one day in 500 years from now or however long from now, if the earth is still going and we're still here somehow, not us, but humans, doing something similar. They're going to have some teacher going to be talking about, you know, a thousand years ago, they had this, and he's going to put a slide up with a credit card. And somebody that they find, and they're going to be like, this was, they carried this around, and they used it for transactions and the kids would be like what like that's you didn't actually have to carry stuff around they didn't just like tap their wrist and pay for everything and have a chip in their arm that pays for everything like they actually had to carry stuff around and you think about it it's like what if it was like your debit card and your name and your all your banking information that'd be like oh my gosh that's my stuff like don't be putting that on slideshows right like you'd be mad it's kind of what we're doing with their boulets here like it has kind of their signature on it somewhere, and then it's like that's their wallet. It's like, I, it's like putting a picture of your wallet and all your credit cards on a slideshow to kind of talk about it. It's kind of a weird thing to do when you really think about it, um, the impacts of what, what these are. So just kind of relating that to a more modern kind of idea. What are we actually looking at here, right? Um, but then we start realizing, like, why do I even have to bother with the token? Why don't I develop some form of a writing system, right, um, that we can just write this stuff down? And, and so um, they end up getting um, this idea where um, you get a piece of wet clay, you take a, a, a stylus, and around 3100 BC, you really had this writing system start to develop where I push the stylus into the clay and I can make these marks. And also if I mess up, I can just take and, and rub that clay and, and, and smooth it back out and do it again, right? Like if I mess up, um, 
if I mess up putting what tokens go in there, like I gotta break the ball and take it back out. Here, I can mess this up and I can just smooth it out and rewrite it, basically like an eraser. Right, which was a was a big advancement, and I'm sure you can see how that would be a much better system of keeping track of what everybody has than than keeping it in a little clay ball, right? Um, and obviously, it's pretty crude, but you can see here from the bottom that, right, like here, this says how many of these things I had, and then this is, and we start writing things out, actually writing them out, major leap forward, uh, and and then you start drawing. And writing. Now, it's really easy to draw items, right? If I want to draw a loaf of bread, I can draw a picture of a loaf of bread and then put tally marks how many I got, correct? Or I can just draw, if I got 10 loaves of bread, I can draw 10 loaves of bread. How do you draw an idea? And this was kind of an interesting thing that we kind of looked at if you watched the, the lectures here, if you saw that it's easy to draw tangible items, but how do you draw something that is not a tangible thing, right? How do you draw an idea or a concept, right? And so you kind of know this one. What does this say if you watch the lecture? Look at y'all watching the lecture. I'm proud of y'all. Please do what I'm doing. Or put your computers away. All right. It's hard to draw love or whatever, but I can draw things that I do know, like an eye and a bee and a leaf. And you can figure out, I believe, right? So the idea that these early writing systems, this is writing. This is not cave art. This is trying something that I can draw that you can interpret and understand what I'm trying to say, correct? That's different than just drawing whatever, just a, 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 an ibex on a cave, which is Right? That's not just a cave drawing. This is the concept drawing. And you go, well, why didn't they use words? Right? Now, I want you to consider something. For a very long time, written language, and there's still a lot of places in the world where their written language and their spoken language are not, they don't spell it out like English. In English, when we write, we spell out our words. What's that called? When you write exactly how you speak, does anybody know what that's called? Phonetically. Phonetically. We write phonetically, which means that our written language and our spoken language are identical, essentially. That is not the case with these early writing systems. They are not phonetic. You want to know why? They don't spell out the words. Because who? Yeah, because they don't spell out the words. But why do we call it phonetically? You're not supposed to know. We're going to talk about it in, in subsequent lectures in a couple weeks. We're going to get to them. But about 2,000 years after people start writing concepts and start this rudimentary idea of writing, we and you have a group of people known as the Phoenicians. And they are the first group that basically take and say, this is what we say. We're going to create an alphabet that kind of matches up with so Mesopotamians have some of that, but they're not writing out the sounds they're making. That's not happening yet. So it's still not writing as what you would maybe think of in modern terms, but it is writing. It is, I'm drawing things for a specific purpose to lay out exactly what I'm trying to say, and you are trained to know that when I write this, this is what I mean. That's writing. That's writing to communicate, okay? beyond just like keeping track of something. All right, and this idea of, of drawing things out by pictures is known as the Rebus Principle, okay? It's the Rebus Principle. So at the end of the day, it's pretty cumbersome, but it is a step forward, once again, step going forward. If you were doing your reflection on, you know, the development of writing, you would start with the, with the early, you know, Boulay system and talk about how it advanced through using the Rebus Principle, and then, you use, you know, the stylus to kind of draw out concepts with the Rebus principle, and you still have, you see there's still like these impressions of like where they use some kind of a token to press it in. But slowly, this gives way to cuneiform. Cuneiform. And 
Cuneiform is the writing system of the early Mesopotamians. It becomes very popular throughout the ancient Near East. And what does the ancient Near East mean? The modern, Middle modern Middle East, right? Mesopotamia, they're kind of interchangeable, right? Um, and so you end up with cuneiform, cuneiform, however you want to say it. And, um, and you can kind of see how this kind of progressed, right? It's more what we would consider like um, Chinese today. Mandarin doesn't, isn't phonetic, is it? I don't think Mandarin is phonetic. I think they use symbols. No, not at all. Yeah, yeah. 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 So they most of the state language is Chinese. No, they, they're more based off of what kind of cuneiform, it's more advanced than this, but it's kind of the same idea. <coughs> In Chinese, you have symbols that mean certain things, and they basically you just spell it out. You learn thousands and thousands of different symbols, and then when you write them out, it makes kind of sentences and tells stories, right? That's, it's kind of how cuneiform works. So you can see that it starts out like this is a man's face. Man. You got a man's head here. You got his eye and his eyebrows and his hair and his nose, his chin, right? Then for some reason, we see a progression where they kind of rotate it. And then it goes from this. They go, let's simplify this a lot. And then you go to here. You still kind of have a nose. And then they go, well, this takes a long time. I'm using a stylus. I don't want to have to, like, draw this out a whole lot, right? And so they start making these wedge marks. And you can kind of see here, so you've got the lines going this way here. And basically, cuneiform is set so that it's all kind of in the same stroke length. <clears throat> this kind of matches up with that. It kind of looks like, you know, the head and stuff. And eventually, they just kind of progress it down. And to where, by the ultimate culmination of this, you get to this means man. When you see this on a document, it means man. That's what it means. I don't have to say, I don't have to spell out M-A-N. I have a symbol. When you see that, that means men. Now, this is a very difficult language, and it limits who can do it, because you literally have to just spend time studying and studying and learning all the symbols and learning all of these things to be able to write in this, right? But the good part is, is that we, can, we have translations, and we've learned basically a good portion, mostly all of the cuneiform ideas, okay? And so... Once they start being able to do this, okay, there's a very, very small percentage of the population that learns how to do this. Um, and you can look here that each one of these symbols is a different word. These are words. They're not letters, okay? Words. And you look at this big, giant page here. This is words. I believe this is actually maybe a tablet um, of the story of Gilgamesh. Okay, the story of Gilgamesh. This is what it looked like. This is the cuneiform writing of the story of Gilgamesh. Okay, and um, it, it's kind of crazy. I mean, um, so, and this is kind of a religious text. And then you end up with the Enuma Elish, which is an origin story. Certainly a mythology and religious text as well. And so you kind of have this process. That's where writing goes keeping track of things, but then once we get to the point that we can express better ideas instead of just using it to keep record, instantly we start making religious texts and mythologies. That's where this is going. And if we're making religious texts and mythologies, because these, these civilizations are so closely linked on religion and governance, laws quickly follow. Does that make sense? Okay, so... Then we got into, so we saw that this was basically just, you know, they you had people that just sat around and trained and learned how to write. Okay? So let's talk about the cos uh, cosmology, right? This was one of your uh, primary sources, okay? Uh, the Enuma Elish. And um, how many of you have read it so far? Just one or two? Okay, so... We're going to go through, and I'm actually going to pull it up. I want you to kind of, we're going to pull this up and look at the Enuma Elish. So 
not a super long read, but we'll kind of go through the story. Because it is kind of difficult to read. I'll try and hit the high points for the most part. But it's the, the Enuma Elish, also known as the Seven Tablets of Creation, is the Mesopotamian creation myth, uh, whose title is derived from the opening lines of the piece, Went on High. Mesopotamia, uh, civilization born in a land whose changing climate and hazardous geography made life difficult, obviously. The capriciousness of the gods helped explain the unpredictable world in which they lived in. What does capricious mean? Capriciousness. You may have a clue? You like uh, Yeah, the conflict. Like, basically, the Mesopotamians believed that the gods were in conflict with them. That the gods didn't like them, actually. Because... Why would the gods flood us and have disease and bad things happen to us? Like, basically, uh, for Mesopotamians, their entire life was an effort to make the gods not unhappy. If the gods, if they went through a drought, it was because their civilization had done something wrong to anger the gods, right? It's this idea that, that we are afraid of the gods, that's why we serve them, not because the gods love us. The gods don't like us. That's the whole idea, that we... They only made us so they can show how powerful they are, not because they want us. So we are just here basically as slaves to them. That's kind of how the Mesopotamians view it, which is a terrible way to see your creator, right? This creation epic follows a bitter conflict between the gods that led to the creation of the world and humanity. Uh, this is the Babylonian version of a much older Sumerian myth because it changes over time. Originally, the chief figure of the story was Enlil, uh, a, the Sumerian storm god, but when the Babylonians conquered Mesopotamia, they established the old Babylonian Empire around 1800 BC. They changed the name of the hero god to Marduk, who is the patron god of Babylon. Now, it's important to understand these, these, these tablets, you know, we have several copies of them, but all of them are kind of damaged or part of them are missing, so it's not a complete story, but you kind of can get the idea here. So we're going to kind of just go through this, because I think it's kind of, it's pretty interesting. Um, tablet one. When on, when on high the heaven had not been named, firm ground below had not been called by name. When primordial Apsu, the begetter, and Tiamat, their begetter, and Tiamat, she who bore them all, their waters mingled as a single body. No reed, hut had spring forth, no marshland had appeared. None of the gods had been brought into being, and none bore a name, and no destinies determined. Then it was the gods were formed in the midst of heaven. Lamu and Lahamu were brought forth by name. They were called. So you've got Tiamat. Tiamat is Apsu. Tiamat is the original god. And basically, this, this little section is saying there's no heaven, there's no earth, and there's just waters mingling, there's no people yet, there's no other gods. Tiamat's just chilling by, her, by herself, okay? And then she creates um, other gods. Okay, so Tiamat like, is like a dragon, promises to wage war against gods, her offspring. The gods find a champion, Mardu. Okay, so you got Tiamat, you have Mamu, Amshar, then you have Anu and Antu, Ea, and then Mardu. So it's, this is kind of progression. I know it's a little weird, but just kind of go with it. Tablet four goes all the way. Thereupon the Lord Marduk, having raised the flood storm, his mighty weapon, to enrage, to enrage Tiamat, he sent word as follows. Why are you risen, haughtily exalted? You have charged your own heart to stir up conflict. Sons reject their own fathers, while you, who have borne them, have forsworn love. You have appointed Kingu as your consort. So Tiamat basically creates all these gods, and then Tiamat decides, I'm just going to pick a fight. I'm just going to stir the pot a little bit. I'm going to call people out. I'm going to pit gods against one another. I'm going to make chaos. The Mesopotamians believed that their creator god, the original god in their culture, was spiteful and hateful and wanted confusion. Like, is that a great way to see your creator? No, it's a, it's a really pessimistic way to see the creation of, of, of your universe, right? But that just kind of gives you insight. These people did not think the gods were on their side. At all. So now you've got Marduk showing up going, hey, Tiamat, you're being a jerk, and I'm going to freaking make you pay for it. Quit being a jerk. You've got this guy, Kingu, who you basically brought up and said, hey, that's my boy. You're my number one in charge. And he is basically being a traitor 
to all the other gods, and he's helping you stir up this mess. I'm going to make you pay for it. Stand up that I and you might meet in single combat. hey -o. when Tiamat heard this, she was like one possessed. She took leave of her senses. In fury, Tiamat, Tiamat cried out loud to the roots of her legs, shook both together. Just angry. You ever been so angry? You just shake. Just, that's Tiamat, this dragon, who is basically mad that Marduk has the nerve to freaking just talk back to her at all. She recites a charm, casting her spell, while the gods of battle sharpen their weapons. Then Tiamat and Marduk joined issue, white waste of gods. They strove in single combat. Lacked in battle, the Lord spread out his net to enfold her. The evil wind, which followed behind, he let loose in her face. Remember, he's the storm god, so now they're fighting, right? Fighting, fighting, fighting. And Marduk is like, 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 and then throws wind in her face. It's like a weapon, dude, it goes full Super Saiyan level 3 on her, and he's like throwing wind and energy power at her, and they're fighting, and Tiamat opens her mouth to consume him, and he drives the evil, he drove in the evil wind while as yet she had not shut her lips. She opens her mouth, she's about to swallow him up, and he's like, like, and shoots this wind storm, hurricane, shoots a hurricane into her mouth. Her body was distended and her mouth was wide open, so the terrible wind filled her belly. Basically went in and like, she hit a hurricane. Gotta be careful with that. She might probably feel a little loosey-goosey after she had a hurricane. Um, he released the arrow and it tore her belly. It cut through her inside, splitting her heart. My God. I think Quentin Tarantino could uh, uh, direct this movie. Um, having thus subdued her, he, he extinguished her life. It's so dramatic. He killed her. After he cast down her carcass to stand upon it. A dude said, Hut up! Right? Like, what's up? After he had slain Tiamat, the leader, her band was shattered, her troop broken up. And the gods, her helpers, who marched at her side, trembling with terror, turned their backs. Basically, they turned their backs to run. In order to save and preserve their lives, tightly encircled, they could not escape. So Marduk's people surrounded them. And then he's going to extinguish everybody that had been kind of uh, against the other gods, right? He's going to fight back and, and wipe out all the descent. He made them captives and smashed their weapons. Thrown into the net, they found themselves ensnared, placed in cells. They were filled with wailing. Bearing his wrath, they were held in prison. And the eleven creatures which she had charged with all, the whole band of demons that marched by, marched on her right, he cast into fetters, their hands be bound, for all the resistance he trampled them underfoot. And Kingu, who had been chief among them, he bound and accounted him to Ugwe. So he puts them all in chains. Now, <coughs> Can y'all think of any other kind of mythology stories that have something similar to this happening, where the, king, the, the gods of this go to battle, one side wins, and the, the old gods that supported the main one, they kind of get put in chains and shackled and, 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 and enslaved, kind of. Does that sound familiar? Probably not, because we haven't talked about Greece yet. Anybody ever heard of the Titans? In Greek mythology, Titans, when Zeus goes and fights his father and the Titan and his dad, Kronos, uses the Titans to fight against Zeus, and Zeus and his and the gods of Olympus win. What do they do with them? They kill Kronos and then they chain up the Titans and lock them in the earth, right? Like they throw them into volcanoes. Kind of similar, isn't it? Greeks probably remember share of information, right? Information passing in and out. Would not be surprised if as this story was that it probably got to Greece and Greece was like, they were like, you know, that's a pretty good story. We just change the names of these people and use it again. So, and I don't know if this is like connected or not, but you said that the, that it was kind of, the team that was kind of like a dragon. Mm -hmm. There's like a bunch, there's like a bunch of stories where the gods fight like a serpent. Yeah. Monster. Especially in Asian culture. In a lot too. of them. In like a, a lot of them. Yeah. Even in, even in 
biblical writing, how was Satan represented in the Garden of Eden? Right? And so, when the arteries of her blood he had severed, the north wind bore it to places undisclosed. On seeing this, the, his fathers were joyous and jubilant. They brought gifts to homage him. Then the Lord paused to view her dead body, that he might divide the form and do artful works. This dude is literally looking at her dead body. He's like, where? I'm going to make Right. He split her like a shellfish into two parts, which is funny. Split her like a crawfish. <laughs> half of her, he set up as a covering for heaven. Split her body in half. He skinned her. He took the skin and he stretched it across the sky and created the heaven. The other half, he pulled, uh, he pulled down the bar and posted guards. He bade them to allow her not, her not her waters to escape. He constructed stations for the great gods, fixing their astral likenesses to the stars of the zodiac. So he takes the great gods and he says, I'm going to take your pictures and I'm going to basically tattoo her skin with your faces on it, those of you that helped me. That's how they are explaining the constellations. They explain these constellations of stars, but those are, those are the tattoos on the skin of Tiamat that Marduk stretched on the sky. He honored the people that helped him by tattooing their faces and their likenesses on, the, on her skin so that everybody could see it. That's, that's what they're saying. After defining the days of the earth, he set up three constellations for each of the 12 months. After defining the days of the year by means of heavenly figures, he found did the station of the pole star to determine their bounds, that none might err or go astray. Alongside, he set up the stations of Enlil and Ea. Having opened up the gates on both sides, he strengthened the locks to the left and to the right. In her belly, he established the zenith. The moon he caused to shine, entrusting the night to him. He appointed him a creature of the night to signify the days and marked off every month without cease by the means of his crown. At the month... Very start rising over the land. You shall have luminous horns to signify six days on the seventh day reaching a half crown. What's he talking about there? Half crown. What does that mean? The crown in his saying is the moon. He's talking about he establishes the phases of the moon. You hear what I'm saying? What's the, what's the cycle of a moon? 28 days, right? So, basically, you can measure the months by the moon, which we knew this. Most ancient civilizations based their calendar off of the moon. 28-day moon cycle, right? And you can mark that off. So, after seven days, it goes to half moon. After 14 days, it goes to, uh, what is it? No moon? Well, that's not the... Right. New moon. Yeah, but a new moon, what is it when there's no moon in the sky? Because it's all waned. Or waxed. Waned. I don't know. Waned? Waned is when it gets smaller, right? So it wanes until it's gone, and then it waxes back for 14 more days. So essentially, the, they're establishing this calendar. Now, this is important. It's established on 28 days, Right? Yeah? That's the calendar that we use to mark time. What's wrong with the 28-day month? There's more days than that, right? So if you go back and you look at some of these dates and you try and date them by what they say how long something was, they're basing it off of a calendar that is incomplete. Most evidence shows that they actually swapped to nine-month calendar, not 12. That because this year, when it said 12 months, it probably was the indication of a year. And by the time they translated this, they translated that to 12 months. But it's probably nine months because a baby, how long does it take a baby to grow? 
nine months in the womb, right? In utero. That would have been considered a year. So you probably have nine 28 month days, or 28 day months, essentially. Somewhere around there. Make sense? That's why the calendar was so messed up. That's why when, when we swap from BC to, to AD, it has less to do with Christ, right? It has more to do with that's when they adopted Julius Caesar's calendar, which was based off of Egyptian calendars, which the Egyptians worshipped the moon or the sun, which is a way better way to, to keep track of days. Just letting you know. I mean, you're talking about 28, 9, 28 day months. You're talking about like 215 days a year. It means every three years you really, or ever, it takes you four years to really go three years or two years. You know what I'm saying? Anyways. Um, just kind of giving you some background because I think that I'm not saying that some of the biblical characters and biblical figures that we read that were like, this man was 480 years old, right? Or 600 years old. Well, if you're measuring it off of 200 day years, you could be, it, you could easily see how someone who could live 100 years would easily become 200 years old if you're using the wrong calendar. Does that make sense? So the record may have been right. He lived for 250 years on the calendar they used. Does that make sense at all? I'm just giving some ideas of, of, of justification on some of that because you can kind of see how it's set up even by the Mesopotamians who didn't know literally anything. Um, when the sun overtakes you at the base of heaven, diminish your crown and retrogress into light. So when the sun comes back around, the moon goes away. and You're no longer the brightest thing in the sky. At the time of the disappearance, approach the course of the sun. On the thirtieth, you shall again stand in opposition to the sun. After you appointed the days to Shamash and established the precincts of night and day, taking the spittle of Tiamat, Marduk created, or he formed the crown and clouds and filled them with water. He took the saliva dripping out of the dead dragon, and he was like, ooh, I can do something with this. And he was like, he threw it into the sky and made clouds. Say clouds are dragon spit. The raising of winds, he, the bringing of cold, rain and cold, making of mist smoke piling up. These he planned to himself, took into his own hand, putting his head into, into position he formed there, there on the mountains, opening the deep which was in flood. He caused to flow from her eyes the Euphrates and Tigers, stopping her nostrils, he left. So he cuts off her head, puts it on the land, right? Dragon head is rocky and thorny, right? Mountains. Out of her eyes because she was crying because she lost Tigris and Euphrates River. He formed from her breast the lofty mountain there, and he drilled springs from wells to carry off the water. Opening his mouth, he addressed Ahab to impart the plan he had conceived in his heart. I will take blood and fashion bone. I will establish a savage man, shall be his name. Look at this. I shall, I will establish a savage. When the Mesopotamian gods created man, they did not do it in their own image. They created savages that would serve them. It's a little different than the way we see it in Genesis, isn't it? Truly savage man I will create. He shall be charged with the service of the gods that they might be at ease. So basically, we're going to make them slaves so we don't have to do anything. So, A advises that only one of the gods should die to provide the blood and bone needed to create humanity. He suggests that it should be a god who plotted evil against the other gods. Mardu asked these simple gods who was responsible for inciting Tiavat's rebellion. They named Kingu as the culprit. So, they take Kingu and they say, this is the guy that convinced Tiamat to be uh, bad. They bound Kingu, holding him before Ea. They imposed on him the punishment and severed his blood vessels. Out of his blood, they fashioned mankind. From a traitor who betrayed everybody, they fashioned mankind. He imposed on him the service and let free the gods. After Ea, the wise, he created mankind and imposed upon them service of the gods. 
That work was beyond comprehension. As artfully planned by Marduk, did Nudimund created Marduk, the king of the gods, divided all the great gods above and below. He assigned them to Anu to guard his instructions. Three hundred in heavens, he stationed his guard. In like manner, the ways of the earth he's defined in heaven and on earth. Six hundred. Thus he settled after he had ordered all the instructions to Anunnaki of heaven and earth had allotted their portion. The Anunnaki opened their mouth and said to Marduk, their Lord, now, O Lord, you who have caused our deliverance, what shall be our homage to you? Let us build a shrine for those whose names shall be called. Blow a chamber for our mighty rest. Let, it, let us repose in it. Let us build a throne, a recess for his abode. What are they talking, what are they talking about? Anybody? Building ziggurats. We should make these people build us places so that we can go rest. And overlook them. He's basically saying, think about it, it's a religious text. How is it if I am a religious leader and I'm in charge of everything, how do I convince you to spend all this effort and time and manpower building a ziggurat? If the God said he had to. Here's a story. Transpose this. God gave it to me. Marduk came down and told me, build ziggurats. Well, and if you don't, look what he did to Tiamat. He's going to do it to you. It's fear. Brightly glowed his features like the day. Construct Babylon, whose building you have requested. Let its brickwork be fashioned. You shall name it the sanctuary. Thus ends the Enuma Elish. What do y'all think? Remember, discussion a little bit. What do y'all think? No one has any thoughts. You have to, you know, y'all have to do an assignment on this, right? It's not, this is not a chance to kind of get some ideas flowing. These questions down here at the bottom, they kind of give you a, um, a framework to maybe go off of a little bit. Yeah. <coughs> I think it is dramatic. Look at these three questions. How would you kind of discuss this? How does Marduk create the heavens and earth? But how does Marduk create mankind? Is this ancient anime? This is a funny question. It's certain. Right? What's the, what's the, isn't it, I mean, it's strange. That these, these are not gods that love their people. These are not gods that require love from their people. Is there anything mentioned about, you know, they'll appreciate us, I love them, look what we've created, this is great. No, none of that. Control, right? By control. I'm the only person that can talk to these gods. They said build a temple. Well, who's going to live in the temple? I'm going to live in the temple and I'll go talk to the gods for you. So they build these giant houses for the priests, which is great. You're a priest, right? <coughs> oh, he's mad at you. I better do something really good way of control. Because it's not based on, on that these gods want good things for you. They don't care. These gods didn't care about those things. Matthew? Anything else? So let's go back and look at this some more. The other story that we told was the story of Gilgamesh, which is a really interesting story. Also, um, Gilgamesh um, it was kind of an ancient bestseller, right? Uh, I mean, copy after copy after copy after copy. We actually have, uh, of this story, we have 12 
that have survived in various fragments. Twelve of them. That's it. Twelve of them. Okay. Um, but it's very popular for literally thousands of years. It's, it's circulated as much as probably per capita as much as the Bible is circulated. I mean, you're talking about every Mesopotamian had read or knew the story of Gilgamesh, period. Uh, they may not have all been able to read it for themselves, but they knew the story. And here's basically the story. So you have this guy, Gilgamesh. He's two-thirds man, one-third God. And a place called Uruk. He's the king. And Uruk, uh, he's kind of this demigod. That's, so they've got the part of him that's deity, and because he's a deity, he has no peers. So he's very lonely. He's the he's a half or he's a third god. He's lonely. He has nobody to hang out with because nobody can do the things he does, right? And one day he's out hunting, and he runs in this guy, into this guy in the wilderness known as Enkidu. And Enkidu is big and strong and powerful, and they get into a fight. Like they're like. Like, I imagine it's like they were walking along in the woods, and, like, they see each other coming, and it was one of those situations where it's like, this dude better move out of my way. And the other guy's like, he better move out of my way. And they keep walking, and neither one of them's moving, and they get to each other, and they're like, uh, bro, I'm walking here. And he's just like, uh, bro, I'm walking here, okay? Like, you need to move. You, do you know who I am? You don't know me? Gilgamesh is like, no, no, bro. <laughs> no, bro. You don't know me. You don't want to up out my way. He's like, oh, I'm going to make you get out of my way. No, I'm going to make you get out of my way. And they start wrestling and fighting, right? And Gilgamesh is like, oh, dang, this dude got some muscles. Got to leave. I've been able to whoop everybody. This dude's kind of <laughs> <kinda> strong, <laughs> right? And he kind of meets his match. And through this kind of fight, they come to basically respect each other, right? Like, I think of it like Rocky and Apollo Creed. You know, like, they, they eventually, they, they don't like each other, and then they box two more two times, and they're like, dang, dude, you're uh, Apollo. I mean, you're, 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 pretty, you're pretty strong, and you fight real good. And he's like, so it's like, dude, you, you're kind of the bomb. And he's like, no, dude, you're kind of the bomb. <laughs> Did we just become best friends? Yup. You want to go do karate in the garage? Yup. Can we make our beds into bunk beds? Yup. So, um, basically, they become BFFs and they spend a lot of time running around and hunting, right? So they're hunting and they're like, huh, I bet you I can catch that deer and kill it with my bare hands. It's like, oh, not before I can. They take off, you know, like, they're doing like really ridiculous, weird, like, One day they're out hunting and they come across this bull. No way! Dang, that went fast. Maybe not for y'all. I felt like that went kind of fast. 